Hello. Hello. Everybody, happy uh, Monday. I've just noticed something. Me camera's shagged. Wait a second. I'll fix this. You don't need to worry about this at all, lads. Do now don't panic. I know exactly what's wrong. I did a thing with the yoke earlier, and now I need to see will it work. Oh, Jesus, how do we fix this? Hang on now. Who's... Did you, it, hang on, it's getting better. Look, I nearly fixed it. How the hell did that happen? I've I've no idea, lads. Um, does something? <laughs> it's all under control. Don't worry now for a second. Hang on, just just talk amongst yourselves for a minute as I fix this thing. Can I get a refund? No, it was working earlier. I promise. They've done studies, you know. <clears throat> Hi on, lads. This is serious. I'm after completely and utterly breaking it. Yeah, there's no audio on that screen. Oh, Jesus. Let's sit in here for the minute as I try and... Oh, I'm after breaking it. Hope you're all keeping very well. Happy Monday. Look at this, Look at this guy. <laughs> I bring this on myself. I ju ju it's totally fine. Very professional setup here, lads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll just have to... Ah, Jesus. Talk about an anticlimax. Right. How do we fix this? It keeps moving, look. Over here, it's not bad, but look, the frame itself moved. Boy, that escalated quickly. We need to fix this. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. <laughs> How do we fix this? It's totally shagged. Hang on. It's the wrong screen. Don't go anywhere. Don't even adjust the thing. I'll be back in a jiffy. I need to fix the thing. It's shagged. Hang on. Oh, behave. <laughs> Do you remember that time I nearly went live? Jesus! Who's in charge? Anyway, you're all very welcome aboard. Happy Monday! <laughs> right. Now, now that we got that out of our system. I'm in a glass case of emotion! I didn't realise that there was a thing working with the thing. It didn't do it unless I was live. That's what happened. Seemingly there's some sort of a 3D moving transition thing. And it made a complete and utter balls of the situation. She listen, it's grand. Look at this big E just yeah, get it out of the system, lads. <laughs> Hope you're all keeping very well. Hope you're having a pleasant evening and your weekend was filled with joyous occasions and a stress-free environment. And if it was, brilliant! If it wasn't, don't worry, I've taken it all on myself. Yes, that's right. I've did the whole thing. <sighs> Boy. Jeez. That escalated quickly. Anyway. Welcome I mean, in. that really got out of hand fast. I, I'm in a hoop, but it's fine. We'll figure it out as we go. Wait, why is that coming up? Did something Can I get a refund? 
It's all broken. No, it was all perfect. And it's Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. You leave something alone, it's absolutely perfect. And when you come back to it, it's shagged. And then my laptop turned off. Oh, what is this madness? Anyway, it's totally fine. Technical. It happens, lads. It just shows it happens, right? So uh, we're here. Part three of the Gallic Wars. Jesus, the Gallic Wars would have been easier than this. Anyway, I'll tell you all about it. The uh, pivotal battle of uh, Bibracte. Bibracte, as we're going to fly over modern France. This is a key victory by Caesar. And uh, we get to experience the lush landscapes of the French countryside, reminiscent of the battlegrounds where Caesar proved his military metal. That's right. So, uh, Marf, where are we at? Seb, don't go. I'm in a now terrible hoop. I'm in a terrible hoop. But we'll talk about it now in a second when it all unravels itself, which it should. So, look at this. Look, there's something on the screen. It's a distraction. It's a helicopter. It's very nice. Why is that working? It's very nice, isn't it? Beautiful. Hang on. I nearly have it. Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. <laughs> right, now, why is that coming? Oh, yeah, right, Grant. I'll show you what we're doing first. How's that? How's that for an old plan, lads? Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. They're all redeeming it, and now all the alerts are on the wrong scale. <laughs> Why did I put my... I, who can I, I can't blame anyone. It's my own stupid fault. Gibbo made me a beautiful new frame, and I couldn't get it working weeks ago, right? Weeks ago. And then he said, Murph, you know you just need to do this and this. Dude, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. I wish I yeah, were. Dude, have you been drinking? <laughs> I have, Ted. I've been drinking... Calm in the house now. Let's just calm it all. Anyway, Gibbo said you can fix it. What in the... It's shagged, lads. Totally broken. Who's in charge? You haven't a clue what you're doing. He says you can fix it just by doing this. And I did, you know, this. And it worked perfectly. I was like, holy crap, it worked. Brilliant. And... They've done studies, you know. Then suddenly it isn't. 60% of the time, it works every time. Anyway, not like me. It, it wouldn't be me. To be fair, there's enough of the high... Quality, professional. Do you know what I mean? I kind of bring it back down to earth a little bit. Do you know? Can't be always at the top. Uh, but anyway, where are we at? We're over here. Where's the button? Yes, it says. Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Moving on. Uh, right, now, tonight. Yes, Welcome friends. Welcome to my secret underground <laughs> day. I can't get a word in edgeways. Calm it with the alerts for a minute to get my head sorted. I can't think. <laughs> And I was off today and everything. Right, part yeah. three. We're going the wrong way. Part two. <laughs> Later that night, Murphy roared himself to sleep. Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Is it all breaking the stuff? Stop breaking the stuff. Just leave it alone. Sit in your hands. Or, you know, uh, something, right? No, I... Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Keith Farrell is here. Good to see you, Keith. <laughs> I'll start off at the beginning somewhere. And, uh... Jesus. This is, this is a tough one, lads, tonight. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, but anyway... Calm it... Dougal, have you been drinking? I Calm it Ted. all down. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. <sighs> oh, Jesus. Thanks, lads. Yeah, any time... Sure, was <laughs> throw him to the lions, throw him to the floor. Jesus. Right, hang on a second. Dougal, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Hang on, I'm going to press a button that'll nuke it. Uh, don't spend monies on your alerts, because they're going to be stopped now, because the place is going out of control. Hang on. I think Streamlabs is having an issue. Just, 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 shh. Dougal, have you been... Why is it still working? Dude, I'm about to press the button to make I it have stop. Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Ah, Jesus. And This is terrible. Hello there. <laughs> Disable everything. Dude, have you been drinking? I have, Ted. I've been drinking like a mad idiot. Who's in charge here? I mean, literally, who's Dude, in charge? Been drinking? I have, Ted. Is that I've thing been just... drinking like a mad idiot. Pause alerts. You cannot disable it. I can't do many. Dude, have Boy. you been drinking? I have Ted. That escalated I've been quick. drinking like a mad idiot. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Ah, oh, Jesus. I'm in a glass case of emotion. Hang on. 
The whole thing, this couldn't have gotten any better. The whole thing is shagged. How do you fix this now? Settings? No. Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy, snooze. Man. Can I get a refund? No, you can't. Shag off. Manage rewards. Where's the button? Disable everything. How do you do that? Uh, manage alerts? No. No, no. Oh, Jesus. Turn that off. The lights we can leave on because the rest is just friggin' nuts, right? Just, just, just calm it down now for a minute, lads. Uh, uh, uh. Right, now. We'll calm these now for a minute. Don't go press them. We need to fix this out. Right. Anyway, you're all very welcome. <laughs> Where is that? Gibbo told me to do something about Liverpool tonight. I wish I should have. That would have been much more easier, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Uh, but anyway, um, right, let's start this again. Hello, good evening, happy Monday. Welcome to what will hopefully be a stream as we go flying. And my laptop turned off. Updates are underway. Ah, oh, Jesus. Anyway, we're on the ground here at Bern. We stopped off here last week following the Helvetii. Well, Caesar following the Helvetii. And for tonight, we're flying in a helicopter as we ramble our way back across, across, across uh, Switzerland into France until we come over to Bibrac Day. Uh, and that's where they had a big fight, a big massive battle and uh, the defining moment of the start of the Gallic War. So we'll learn all about it. We're going to learn about the equipment, the structure, the whole shebang uh, of what the Romans are getting up to. But for the flying element, we're taking off here from Lima Sierra Zulu Bravo at the Bern. Then we're heading back across by Lake Geneva. Uh, and we're going to stop off at Lima Sierra Golf Charlie. Then into France, we go to Lima Foxtrot Golf Juliet. And before we get to our final stop of the night, we're going to ramble over itself to Bibrac Day. Uh, there's actually a museum and stuff like that on site. So we're going to fly around the grounds, get an idea of the landscape, and then we're going to head back to Lima Foxtrot Quebec. Foxtrot, that is, friends, the plan of tonight's flight, you see. And it was Jace. Where's um where's the cavalry when you need it? Where's Mrs. Chewton when you need her? I think we're fine. I think I think all is well, right? You saw nothing, lads. Totally fine. This will all just be, you know, it'll be edited out. Yeah, yeah. It'll start off at a very high note. Jesus, that more fella. He's never made a mistake. In actual fact, his computer has never, or in fact, his audience has never once taken over the stream. Yep, never once happened. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? We're playing some music. Before it all got, you know, crazy. <sighs> right, so, welcome everyone into the chat. I hope you're still here. Nutty Slack, good to see you. Dougal McTavish is here. Spitfire RAF 100. Uh, Gibbo Ireland. Ah, Gibbo, look what's after happening. Good to see you, man. Chox is here. Sun Jammer, onboard simulations. Uh, who else is here? Energizer, welcome in. Muse fan, good to see you. Viper Strike, Hemingbird, good evening. Dougal again. How are you, Dougal? Kingsman rambles in. Uh, Patrick, good to Hello see you, Patrick. There. How are they still happening? Uh, mm, uh, the Kingsman, good to see you. Goblin Zeus, Bonsoir. Cy Murray is in the house. Uh, who else is here to help? Is there help? Is there someone called help here? Uh, Bossman Gaming, good to see you. Bell Bro, welcome in. Uh, he forgot his tasty, uh, tasty beverage is here beside me. Zybok Doc, happy Monday to you. Kozaki Flyer is here. QC Frank, welcome in. Colonel Fork is like, um, <clears throat> and like Rome, the Murphy Empire fell <laughs> from the inside out. <sighs> Robert, welcome in. Cy Murray, good to see you. Uh, who else is here? Look, we're catching up now. Wombat, welcome in. Vacuum. Look at this big Jesus. It's terrible. Tarnish Mossman, good to see you. Twisted Mexican, welcome in. Spitfire RAF 100 is here in the chat. It's all happening now, lads. Wayne Prefontaine is in the house. Good to see you, man. Clarky, welcome aboard. How are you? You weren't nice enough to the computer. The thing is out to get me. <sighs> A giant waffle cake is here. Welcome in. <laughs> Murph and technology does not fit. No, and like I've, I've, I've monitors flashing saying warning. <laughs> right? <sighs> Anyway, where are we at now? Fornax, just subscribe. Thank you very much indeed. We've got a couple of subs. Thank you very, very much indeed, lads. Really do appreciate it all. The support that you give. Why you give it, I don't know. Because I break everything. That's why I can't have nice things. Mr. Dan, good to see you. Um, now, let me see. Will a Cessna 172 be grand? It should be. Yes, it should be. Uh, I'm getting a complex as Dougal. You? I, right? It's, it's, called, it's a Dougal alert. And uh, it was working fine. It's still working fine. I'm not working fine. I need to fix everything. Hey, Epic Fool is here. Good to see you. If Marv was a stand-up comedian, he'd be useless at or handling hecklers. 
I'd be used to handling hecklers. What are you talking about? I would, yeah. I've no patience for it at all. I'd actually go down and like, you know, take their pint and burst them. Yeah, shut up, will you? Do you know? Uh, but anyway, it's a regular Monday evening. Indeed, indeed. All is well. Murph needs an SOS. Sending out an SOS. Don't press the big red button. Ah, now, Ted, come on. All right. Hey, Hangar Studio. What are you all laughing at? That wasn't funny yeah, at all. Baby. Yeah, baby. Why are there things still happening? I've turned them off from the gadgets. There shouldn't be anything happening. Should be normal. Should be safe and tranquil and nothing going off me. You think it's bad for you? I've the volume. <sighs> Jesus! Boy. I've the yeah, volume cranked up to like a thousand in my ears. I, mean, I can't that hear really it. really got out of hand fast. And of Dolby Atmos. What's your man do? These were turned off and now they're still on. I can't do the thing. It's all broken. Due to Murphy's incompetence and eejitness, I bought the VA. <laughs> Viper. I, I knew I was saving up these points for something. Through my secret oh, under the, the, yeah, the whole thing is shagged. The whole thing is broke. Oh. Squawk 77. Yes, Kozaki. Oh, look at that stunner. Thank you, Epic Fool. Nice chopper as well, right? Ah, come on. No, no, really no. Murphy rules, mate. If uh, it can go wrong, it'll go all wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, it will. Paul Weaver, good to see you. Uh, DCS Ducks, welcome aboard. <laughs> Kibbo's enjoying himself. <laughs> Kibbo's having fun. This is a great stream. We should do the Romans more often. Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. Just when I thought it was fixed, someone went off and turned off my lights. I mean... None of me buttons are working. Anyway, uh, where are we at? I have to fly a helicopter on top of all of this. I have to fly a helicopter. Jesus. Why couldn't I just gone with something simple? Oh. Lumia Stream. Why is that even doing the thing? Um, we're not laughing with you. No, I know. I know. You're laughing at me. Right? Damn it, Jim. Mad Jim. Look what they're doing. Murph, did you hear about the famous Italian chef that died? He passed away. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Top of the evening to you. Toto, good to see you. Keep it going, folks. He's almost broken. Uh, broken. Broken. I'm going to roar myself to sleep. Good night, darling. Have a pleasant sleep. What? <gasps> For the whole night? I'll just scream. Uh, we're laughing towards you. It's completely different. You should have filled it with your buttons after waking. I did. Super tie. All of this was done in advance of this. And then it all broke. It was totally fine. Can't stop laughing with your... Look at this big E just... <laughs> Why are they still working? They shouldn't be. Anyway, uh, with a capital M. Wait. Hello, guys, and hello, Merv. Hello, Larger Life. Good to see you. Uh, now, where are we at? We're up here, though. Wayland, good to see you. Uh, fiddle the buttons. <laughs> is the... Wait, now. Is this online session called Hellivation or Aviation History? Ruben, I, listen, I don't know. I just don't know. Anyway, all is well. Nice rotors. Daz Higgy, thanks very much. Don't look in fact. Yeah, nice rotors yourself now. Uh, right. All this laughter who's is making... You who's, haven't a clue what you're doing. Who's laughing? This isn't a funny situation. This is like the opposite to like easy listening. If Dreamy, did, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. There's no end to it. It just won't stop. <laughs> We've given the power to the people and the people... Won't stop acting the genus. <laughs> That's basically where it's at. Serious, perhaps a mod you can turn off the rewards for a bit. I've tried it, Chocks. I tried it. It didn't work, Chocks. Right? This stream is so far uh, just screams Murphy to me. Oh no, Mur Monday to me. Captain Mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you something, you ignored it. <gasps> Who? Me? What did you say? Hang on. You said Nabbin earlier on, then you gave a Guinness to Gibbo. What did you say, Kaharia? You let Murphy do a stream. <laughs> Right? Anyway, shh, shh, shh. let's go fly. Yes, yes, that'll take the pressure off. So look at this thing. The H160 by High Performance Group. This thing is very nice. Very, very nice. And it's a nice helicopter that we're going to learn a little look bit at about. This biggie, just... Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. They're supposed to be turned off. Why aren't they turned off? How would you... Wait now. Is there a way... Let's not do it now. Let's just go flying. Let's let's try and have uh, an enjoyable evening of culture, you know, and history. Hey, Castella Eagle, good to see you. Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> this could be used as a textbook example of what to do and not on what not to do. Yes, yes, yes. All that force should sort you out. Thanks, Epic. Oh, you sent me a DM. Hang on. 
You see, I can't go harry you because it's not linked through OBS. It's through Twitch directly, which is the headache. But it's grand. Give him five minutes and he'd be shouting at A2 fireflies. <laughs> anyway, look at the state of this thing. This here is the H160. It's based on the new Airbus helicopter and it's absolutely stunning, lads. The newest release from High Performance Group, it's, uh, well, she's a stunner. It's also very sophisticated, unlike the host of tonight's stream. This thing is highly automated. It can do automatic takeoffs, it can auto hover, even automatic landings. It's an absolute beaut. Uh, looks wise, it's very similar to the Eurocopter SA365. Boy, that escalated quickly. And somewhere I mean, that between, really got out of hand fast. <laughs> it's somewhere between that and uh, the AW139. It's of that same sort of size. Now, the aircraft we've chosen tonight is the luxury variant of it. Instead of having, you know, 16 people crammed in the back, we have six. Do you know, uh, it's very pretty though, isn't it? There's something on the way. Something. I'd actually like to see the auto land on this. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Based now on how everything is going for me tonight, nothing is going to be automated. Nothing. Welcome to my secret underground day. If only you could see. You can't. That laptop over there says... Something didn't go as planned. No need to worry. Undoing changes. Keep your computer turned on. I kid you not. That's what my laptop says. The story of tonight. The whole thing is chagged. But anyway, um, right. Let's let's go flying. So, yes, yes, yes. Here we are. Hello, helicopter. Yes, you're looking good here now. Right, so we do have some storage covers. We're going to remove those. And if we go to our crew and payload, well, we'll open the door. You close the door. We'll open the door. Beautiful animations, isn't there? Oh, oh, this thing is top notch. Right, so we'll uh, we'll load it up there now, Bartholomew. So pilot, co-pilot, uh, Timmy, Vinny, Jimmy, Dreamy, sleepy, and... nighty, snoozy, snooze. Which is your man? Look at the gloves on your man. Look, who was that? Uh, you're in the H one four five. Nice. Murphy's Law and somewhere a little devil sits laughing in hell while watching your stream. Anytime or. Yeah, every time or any time I have displeased someone, displeased someone, uh, or I might have passed comment, they're now getting, it's karma, it's called karma. For every bad thing I've done in my life, it's all coming back tonight. Yes, yes, yes. I uh, hope this comes with Mr. Coffee. Mr. Look at it. I mean, who wears brown gloves like that? Jesus, he's looking straight at us. Right, it's Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> in you get now and close the doors. Yes. Excellent. It's done very nice, isn't it? Done very nice. So up to our overhead, we're going to get the batteries turned on. There's one. There's two. Generators go into the on position. We're on DC power. The GPU is on. Emergency gens turned That's on. Uh, we're also going to get our hydraulic systems, uh, FMS computers, and all the jazz is up and running. Someone pressed a button. There's a great book in the back. What was there? That's a big ten four, good buddy. Oh, look, there is. There's books back here, look. There's a key, a fire extinguisher. I never I never ventured in the back. Can you open the oh you can! <gasps> That's a big 10 for good buddy. Yes, yes, yes. h 160s for dummies. Brilliant. What's in this one? Ah, nothing. Ah, that's no crack at all. Uh, Jemima, good to see you. Helen, you're looking, you know. That's a big 10 for good buddy. Why are things very loud in my head? What's all this now? Hey, thank you very much for becoming a member. And here I thought it'd be a drab history lesson on the background while I was working. This is totally fine, Delta Tango. It's fine. We're going to make ten four, good buddy. We're going to learn things together. What's this? Aaron has become an e-member. Thank you very much indeed. What's an e-member? Oh, they're on YouTube, are they? Well, thank you very much. Why on earth are you doing that? But thank you very much. My laptop still isn't on. Look. Uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Continue on there, Jesus. I'm all torso. Uh, now, come down here to this gadget. We need to turn these lads on. Yes. That looks good to me. Uh, we'll put our map in on one side. We're going to put uh, charts in on the other side. Let that load up. It should load up. No chart available. Well. No chart available. Hmm. Uh, we can go to flight plan. 
Now, coming down here, yeah, we have our FM transmitter. Let's have a look here. Yes, yes, yes. Turn it on there. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll also put uh, our weather onto standby. Anti-collision lights got red. Position light on. Signs reading ambient light on. Emergency lights or emergency exit lights. Put them to arm mode. Put it into nighttime navigation. And we'll crank up the green only because it looks better. It looks way better. Uh, oh, Jesus. Storm... Or is it Stewie? Uh, Stu gifted five memberships on YouTube. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. Why didn't I see that in the thing? Oh, wait, it did, look. Stu, 333M, gifted five memberships to the channel. I do believe that's the first gifted subs we've ever had on YouTube. Thank you very, very much indeed. Fair play to you. I, I promise you, every bit of that donation is going towards intelligent artificial intelligence right because my own just isn't good enough i say gibbo is just like slapping his forehead he'd i had one job to do just turn it on one job to do and it all went wrong uh duck says murph says we are learning something and everyone acts like they sit in the last row throwing paper balls and stuff yes 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 iron knob good to see you uh now we're going to learn what murphy's reading point is live on stream yes <laughs> looking badly wait what Buttons are for dummies. That would have been a better one. Anti-collision during the day is set to white and red for night, says Epic Fool. Good man. White during the day and red at night. White day, red night. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, what else we want to do? Hit B and D to reset our barrel. Pretty good. And the rest here, lads, is just going to be going through a normal startup procedure. So up on top, here we go. And we have our engines. So let me see. Keep them in normal. Open the no, don't open them. These guys. So uh go crank and then idle one. And idle two. Yes. Okay, uh ACAS to standby. We'll do that now in a moment once we get going. I will, however, get the terrain alerts on mute. Startup test is okay. APU is still connected. Thank you. We'll go ahead and discharge. Oh, she's coming alive now, lads. Danny Brooks is like, oh dear, tempted to buy a helicopter now. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This sounds good. Sounds of this uh, chopper are brilliant. Okay, so auxiliary pump. That can probably come off now. Uh, now, last bit of stuff here was our transponder. We're going to go into altitude, altitude reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, h is mute. That's okay. Uh, equipment. Let's go into lights. Any light strobes and uh, logo light is turned on here as well. Let's have a quick look on the outside. Ooh, look at this. This is pretty. Check out the sounds, right? They are only, they, they are only beautiful. Right, hang on, I need me map to turn on. One second. We're waiting for the old little laptop to warm up here beside me, lads. And then all will be well in the realm. Sounds are mint, yeah, yeah, they're pretty hard. Sabre says, where are we starting from? Um, we are starting off from Burn Airport. Uh, Lima, Sierra, Zulu, Bravo. Come on, you divin, turn on. Right, now we're laughing. I have me map, I can see where we're going, all is well in the realm. Right, now where are we at? We're over here, look. So, we're kind of finished with this guy for the minute. We can use it for the autopilot if we wish. Uh, now, autopilot upper modes are inhibited while on the ground. That's okay. 
Now, next up, we're going to turn on some multiplayer. There we go. All is looking good. I do have the air manager thing sorted, which is nice. Because that wasn't working last week. Do you remember the air manager? So we might have a look at that now in a moment, right? Uh, it's a money pit. Every week I get tempted to buy and something. How much is this one, Murph? Le traffic. Lenny, uh, oh Jesus, that's giving out about traffic. I got such the fright. <laughs> I was like, there's something talking to me now. <sighs> um, I think it's like 30 quid or 35 bucks. Ruben, we are on the Southeast Asian server. So we're just waiting for uh, some, some things to start loading, but we should be good. Bit of Toby Eye eye tracking here. Yes, we're looking good. We're looking good. There's Kazaki and Tarnus is over there. Beautiful. All right. So, parking brake coming off. And uh, let's start a little bit of movement going forward here, shall we? Oh, wait. Did I remove that GPU? I did. I did. Okay. Pretty. Very, very pretty. Okay, we'll ramble up here to the left. We'll ramble over this way now to see what we can see. Uh, Merv, did Seb say when the first update for the, P uh, the P110? He's working on it, so I think it has to go another week or so, I think. Man, that Phenom is good, isn't it? Okay, let's have a quick look here at what we're doing. So we are walking, we're talking, and we're squawking. There's a hell of a stutter. There we go. There's a whack a mole on the runway. Keep the nose down, Murphy. Okay, we got ourselves turned here. Now, usually with a chopper, you can literally just take off, but there is a skill in trying to, uh, you know what I mean, taxi these things around the place. Alright, okay, so we're going to look for a little bit of collective. And uh, let's ramble up. We don't want stutters, please. There we go. Down the runway, picking up some speed. We don't want stutters, please. <laughs> Gear in. Coming up on 80. There we go, there's 100 knots. We're moving fast now, lads. So we have high terrain here to our left-hand side, so we'll just take it easy for the moment. Keep an eye on that torque here on the left-hand side. Nice. Guys, look at the river. We're going to call you Julia, you know, after Caesar's mom. Or maybe his daughter. They were all called Julia. Oh, Jesus, the terrain is doing a thing. Don't worry about it. Did you ever see the Langoliers? It's a bit like that. Oh, this is pretty up here, isn't it? It's an Airbus helicopter. It is. The Airbus H-160. 160. There's the lads over there. Good stuff. We're just circling, circling around. Uh, because the sim is having a moment trying to load things in, but we should be alright. I say we should be alright. So we should be fairly trimmed here. Yes! Right, now, does that button work? It does! Right, friends, if you're on the Xbox, press 1. If you're on the PC, press 2. And if you're here because you're now exhausted from the drama that was, uh, you press number 3. Hello Fireflies, welcome to the Flying Circus. We live stream every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, 20 hundred Zulu time, right here.
textures are doing a thing on the ground. I have no idea what it is, but sure, listen. Uh, now, let's see what we can do here autopilot-wise. So let's go nav source. We should be set to uh, GPS, I think. Yes. So we're going to say nav source. We're going to say altitude hold. And we're going to say indicated airspeed hold. Emergency flow system. Don't need to worry about that for the moment. So the autopilot will take over here for us, meaning that you can just kind of sit back and relax. Do you know? Uh, 33 on the PC, one on console, and a camera fiddling Muppet who crashed his stream, buttoning away, as well as reading everything. <laughs> Jesus! Super tight! That was heavy! Uh, but it was deserved. Ooh! Um, push that little down arrow on the autopilot. Say what? Push the little down arrow on the autopilot. Oh, this fella. So we're tracking GPS. Oh, look at this collective beep trim. That's very fancy epic, isn't it? So we're cruising along here at about 120 knots. This is perfect. This is what we're after, right? Um, Where are the camera hogs? Oh, you don't want to know. I've broken everything. I will fix it, but I broke everything. Uh, 845 Sim, good to see you, man. Having a sneaky watch. Hope you're having a great flight. Everything is grand. We've had zero issues. Every it's been the most calming, peaceful introduction to a stream that I can remember. Yes, yes, yes. It's been absolutely fine. No pressures or worries here, lads. Oh, Jesus, God. All right. Oh. Ooh, now that was needed. Uh, right, so, uh, my map is working perfect. Hello there. Hello there. Uh, everything here is working. We've got a good few people with us. The textures were doing weird things, weren't they? What was that all about? Uh, right. So, bet you can't learn to, or you can't wait to learn some of this stuff tonight. I only typed about 7,000 words. Part three. Um, the Bracte, the decisive victory over the Helvetii. The flight will be conducted in the Airbus H160, offering a unique opportunity to explore the major historical sites. And the flight route will cover, as we said, Bern over to LSGC, LFGJ, uh, until we get up past Dijon, up past uh, LFQF, showcasing the historical context of where Caesar chased on the Helvetian tribes. Um, the 160, a modern state-of-the-art, medium-sized utility helicopter, offers a combination of advanced technology, performance, and versatilities. So, we'll talk about the chopper before we get into the history. The H-160 designed to serve in a variety of missions, including offshore transport, emergency medical services, or EMS, public services, commercial uh, VIP transport as well. Its sleek and innovative design sets it apart in terms of aesthetics and, indeed, its aerodynamics. A very fancy thing, this, right? Why isn't that working, Muse? There we go. Uh, the helicopter typically accommodates up to 12 uh, in comfortable, spacious cabin layout, depending, of course, on the uh, configuration. It's powered by a Turbo Mecha Arano engine, providing excellent power to weight ratio and fuel efficiency. It has an impressive speed and range capabilities, making it suitable for long distance and high speed missions. It can achieve a cruise speed of about 160 knots and a maximum range of over 500 nautical miles for a helicopter that's impressive. The 160 features advanced avionics including a digital glass cockpit, intuitive and user-friendly interfaces and it incorporates fly-by-wire technology which enhances flight control and the stability. The helicopter also benefits from reduced pilot workload and improved safety features including advanced autopilot functions. They even went into some of the noise reduction. Airbus have placed a strong emphasis on noise reduction in the H-160's design. It incorporates various noise reducing features to make it quieter, both inside and out. The 160 is equipped with the latest safety systems, such as advanced situational awarenesses, tools and systems to prevent unintended pilot actions. There, right? Uh, it boasts high level of reliability, making it suitable for demanding and critical missions, including offshore operations. This is a beautiful helicopter, lads, and one absolutely fantastic to go exploring in these regions. Look at the scenery we have here tonight. It's just stunning. Absolutely stunning. 
So, I have a ton of information, but let's talk about some of the key events here, right? So, the key events leading up to the battle, um, we started off learning much about kind of, we touched on the history of Rome itself, uh, and then with a focus on Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar. And it was during his Gallic campaigns, this is where he really made a name for himself, all right? So what was happening here? Well, the Helvetii migration, due to overpopulation, they wanted extra food, they wanted fertile lands, and of course they were being harassed by some of the German tribes. Well, they were looking to migrate, and they wanted to come down this neck of the woods to the Romans. Caesar wasn't having any of this. There was a general cause for concern uh, for the Roman Republic. I mean, you had a lot of people trying to move down here. But especially when it came to Caesar, he saw this as a huge opportunity. This gave him the green card to go and pick a fight, to expand Roman dominance, but more so expand his own dominance. Um, that's what he was looking. So when the Helvetii um, started to move, Rome got word of this, and then Caesar rambled up to see what was going on. They sent envoys, and Caesar said, listen, sure, come back Hello to me in a week or so, because the Helvetii, they wanted to move through Roman territory, and uh, Caesar said, come back to me in a week, you'll have your answer. Caesar built a massive fortification, a huge wall, and when the Helvetian uh, sc uh, scouts came back, they knew their answer. Now, we, we have to go the other way. So that forced the Helvetii to travel through unfriendly territory, kind of, you know, the northern area just above where Rome had its dominance. That didn't sit well with a lot of the other tribes. I mean, think about it, right? If you were a small-ish sort of a tribe, I don't know, 50, 100,000 people, you had your farms, you had your own little towns, and then suddenly you hear there's some 300,000 people rambling over. Uh, that wasn't good. Any resources you think they were yours? Well, they're now seriously compromised. So, what happened? Well, these lads reached out to Caesar. I say, you, could you give us a hand to make sure these lads, you know, don't cause any grief? Caesar, only delighted to help out. What? You want me to bring my legions into your territory to keep it safe? You want me to bring my legions into your territory? Yes. Yes. Yes, we do. Come on. Hurry up, will you? And that's exactly what happened. He's the Janey, right? So there were a couple of skirmishes at the Arar River. We'll talk about skirmishing and what they meant, the small little battles, before we get up to the massive battles, right? The initial encounters, or the initial encounters between Caesar's legion and the Helvetii showcased the Romans' tactical acumen and discipline. It also shocked the Helvetii something fierce. Caesar selected um, usually high ground for strategic reasons. It goes without saying, back then you didn't have anything other than your eyes and ears. So high ground, you'd see people moving from miles and miles away. With Bracte, there are high, there's high ground surrounding the entire region, and where the battle took place is actually on high ground, which is interesting, right? Um, Roman legions formed a strong defensive line, and we're going to learn a little bit about some of the formations and some of the strategies that the legions had. We, you may have heard of things like Testudo, uh, a certain defensive march, if you like. We'll learn a little bit about that. We're also going to learn about the equipment and the tactics that were used, right? So uh, some of the Roman equipment, including the Lorica, the Gladius, the Pilum, the, uh, the Scutum, right? We'll learn all about those. And uh, what do the Helvetii have? What did they use in battle? Uh, the Romans also employed siege engines, like the Ballistae, Ongars, battering rams and siege towers. They constructed fortifications like Vallum, trenches and defensive walls. Not only that, but the Romans, get this, built roads and bridges for strategic mobility. And people say all roads lead to Rome. Well, in fact, they kind of do, because they were built on ancient Roman roads. Okay, Ireland doesn't have that much of a, of a pickup when it comes to uh, Roman dominance, but certainly in England and throughout France, parts of Germany, you know, the lower countries, down by Switzerland, most of the original roads are built over the original roads. Do you know what I mean? Then we talk about the resupply challenges. Caesar faced resupply problems due to unreliable Gallic allies. This was a huge problem. Caesar knew 
about having supply lines and resupply lines. But now that he ventured out into these kind of allied Gallic tribes to his north, well, they weren't able to supply him. They weren't going to see their own people go hungry and whatever, but a whole bunch of Romans were here. So it would have been very much the case. Uh, yeah, you know that grain we were to give you? We had a bad harvest or um, yeah, we, we, we didn't get it on time. We'll give it to you Thursday. No, no, we mean next Thursday. This posed a huge problem for Caesar because we're sure his lads were hungry. Uh, they needed supplies. It was just going to be a disaster. Caesar ended up um, going to Bibracte for tactical reasons, yes, uh, but also for resupply. That's a very big mountain we're about to hit. Don't worry. We'll just... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we'll just go over it as I disengage the autopilot. Don't panic. Just as well we were looking there. Oh, hang on. Please don't have it. Uh-oh. 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 Why have I no torque? Why have I no torque? Jesus, lads. For a second there, I thought we were doomed. We're doomed. We were nearly doomed. We're all right now, though. <sighs> Ian, we just need to get over. That's the good thing about a helicopter. It's like, don't stop moving forward. And get just climb. This guy. Right? We'll just climb. It's totally fine here, lads. Right, Who's in charge? You up, haven't a clue what you're doing. Pick up this I really don't. Tonight is not a good night for me. Jesus. I've had a very productive last couple of days, but tonight I'm shagged. It's all broken. It's all gone. It's all ruined. Houston, we have a problem. Yes, yes, we have. But it's all right now. We've recovered the situation. Look. Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy snooze. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, no, I can't deal with this. Bit. <sighs> Boy, <laughs> that escalated quickly. Ah. Oh. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. I mean, honest to God. Why isn't this working? Autopilot. Upper autopilot modules require auto trim. Auto trim. Hello there. Now, put back on me altitude, me nav mode, and me indicated speed, please. And don't turn it off again. <sighs> anyway, all is well in the realm. We hope all is well in the realm until we get to the next big hill. We'll be making over friends. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but anyway, so to make a long story short, what actually happened here? Well... The Romans, uh, Caesar raised three uh, more regions. He picked up three legions uh, when he came back to Cisalpine Gaul, and then he grabbed the entire force and they moved north. They were expecting a battle from the Helvetians, and a battle they got. Right? <laughs> so, uh, what happened? The initial skirmish that Caesar had with these guys, well, it wasn't terribly great uh, for the Helvetian. Basically, what happened was there was a, a river. The Seon River, that's where we're heading up to now in a while. Um, about 75% of the Helvetii had crossed this river. Now Caesar was hiding and he waited. He waited until there was about 25% of the Helvetii left. Caesar then swarmed in and massacred them. Completely destroyed them. 25% of the forces gone in a moment. The Helvetii were absolutely disgusted and shocked. How is this honourable. How could you possibly go into battle and not put all your forces up against all the enemy forces? They didn't understand. Caesar didn't give a damn about you know, Helvetian culture or what the yeah, gods baby. wanted. Yeah. He didn't care about any of that. Caesar was there to systematically destroy them. And that's what he set out to do. So, with 25% gone, Caesar had to regroup, resupply, and then things started going wrong. Because, well, he couldn't resupply. Things were not going good at all. Right? I need to immediately take cover. Don't hit the ground, Murphy. Don't hit the ground, Murphy. Don't hit the ground. <laughs> Why are helicopters so difficult to fly? This should be not... F anyway, uh, right, go back into alt. Wait, now, where's the altitude acquire? How do we get this thingy up? Ah, yes, yes. You see... Engage that. Just look at this big Jesus. It's, it's fine. No, 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 no. Get the speed up, Murph. Get the speed up. 165 is what we want. Okay, take over, helicopter. You're so smart. Um, after beat, or after taking out 25% of the Helvetii, Caesar went off to get resupplied. So the Helvetii were already 
further on, Caesar didn't get resupplied. He said, oh bother, we're in trouble here. So he headed back for Bibracte, thinking, well, this is going to be grand. I'll just head back to that town. I'll get resupply and all will be well. However, the Helvetii noticed this and they said, ah, the Romans, out of supplies, let's take them out. So their forces engaged and Caesar only barely got there. I mean, he only barely got back to Bibracte. He was not even in a position to take up a fortified presence. They couldn't get into the city itself. So the city's defences rendered useless, or the town's defences. There were skirmishes harassing the back of Caesar's uh, legions with the Helvetii cavalry. They only barely made it. Here's our first airport, by the way. We're going to touch down here. So, that's the story now, right? They've just made it to uh, Bibracte. They got the supply chains sorted. But now Caesar was facing the entirety of the Helvetian army, which was huge. They reckon anywhere in the region of about 150,000 warriors. Now Caesar was a devil, you know, he'd overestimate numbers greatly. He couldn't do a whole lot else though, because there were many, many eyewitnesses with him. Do you know, he couldn't take the Dennis Hickey out of it. Do you know what I mean? Friend to all, good to see you. Uh, just mowing the lawn there with you, or with your rotor. Man, Jim. All right, so we'll do uh, a quick stop here. Once you kind of figure out the autopilot, this thing is an absolute joy to fly. Rumbling this way. There's everyone over there. Okay, watch the speed here a bit. Okay. Well, some of the old apartments there, looking out the window. Nice, we got so many aircraft here, this is so cool. Okay, watch the speed coming in here. Lead off some of that speed. Looking good. That's not good. Last thing you want to do is hit an L vortex. Oh, the stars are horrible. Look at the amount of choppers here. This is deadly. Right, let's just ramble forward here a little bit. Don't hit the buildings, Murphy. Don't hit the buildings. Okay, we'll touch in here on the left. Easy. Nice! Someone's in an Osprey? Who's that? Stu! Looking good! Okay, easy now. There's the, what's that, a Bell 222? They're really nice. Try not to crash into it, Murph. Easy. Easy. Don't hit the old Grand Caravan. He won't be happy about that at all. We got a Cessna 182 in front of us. Nice. Okay, gently put her down. There we go, that'll do her. Okay, Jesus, that was some crack, wasn't it? That almighty lads. So we've made it to our first stop. Now, where are we at? Uh, the Romans absorbed the Helvetii charges through disciplined formations. This is when the battle started. So the, the fight broke out. Things got absolutely nuts. There was a massive battle and they fought all day and all most of the evening. A clear winner was not known, and it was only through kind of the discipline of the Romans, the systematic mechanical working that they had, that's what we're going to have a look at, um, well, they punched through. 
they beat off the Helvetians. And that was a major point of contention between all the Gallic tribes in Rome. They didn't see them as this, you know, fighting honour army. They just saw them as this sort of a machine that was just relentless. It just kept going, no matter what. It seemed like to be invincible, never-ending. And that was all through the planning um, and the, uh, the strategy when it came to the Roman forces. It was just incredible. So the Roman forces themselves, strategy and leadership. Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar, well, he already pr proved his worth as a skilled military commander, known for his strategic acumen. His strategy in the Gallic Wars involved the use of disciplined Roman legions to subdue the Gallic tribes and expand Roman influence. Caesar chose to engage with the Helvetii, a hilltop settlement out near Bibracte, and the, the strategy was to take advantage of the high elevated terrain for better control of the battlefield. Roman legionaries, mainly fighting with the gladius, the Roman uh, sword, a short sword, ideal for close combat. But they also used the pilum. It was uh, a sort of javelin that they could use. And then they had the scutum. That was the Roman shield, known as the scutum, uh, or scutum. It was a rectangular and it provided excellent protection. Never-ending story. Who are you telling, right? Now... Our next stop, bit of a further run, it is Lima Fox Golf Juliet. 56 nautical miles. Are we ready? Let's have a look. Okay, check your fuel before we go. Parker break off. Bit of power coming in. Ooh, look, a 207. Nice. This is awesome. we got plenty of other aircraft here with us. Everyone lining up there to the left. Looking good. Okay. Let us... Ramble out by the tower. Put the gear in. And let's boogie on. Oh, the choppiness is real. Okay, up at the road here. So all these areas that we're flying tonight, this, these are the routes. This is the passageways uh, that the Romans followed. The Helvetii had to as well. So in a lot of cases, the Helvetii moved first and the Romans just kind of shouted them along. So you can see, like, even areas like this, you've high terrain on both sides. This would have been an ideal scouting location. Now, if you were moving your troops, do you move them through the valley or do you kind of go around it? Or do you go over them? What would you do? Okay, we'll ramble this way for a moment, then we're going to turn to the right at the end of this valley here. Some of the tactics that were used, right? Anywhere from guerrilla tactics, the Helvetii were known for the guerrilla tactics and ambushing strategies. However, at Bibracat, they were drawn into a more conventional battle. When they did engage, the Helvetii often relied on charging tactics, attempting to break the Roman lines through sheer, uh, sheer force and ferocity. And we had a look last week at my epic drawings. <laughs> um... How the Romans dealt with that, they would never leave one rank or the first rank fighting for a prolonged, uh, a prolonged period of time. They're constantly changing things up. So if you found yourself in the front row of defence, you'd only be there for about 15 or 20 minutes. Then, a whistle blast, usually by your centurion, and that was your signal to take a pace to your right and two steps back. That allowed the second rank come into first and the third rank come into second. And this was repeated the entire time. Now, that only works when you're advancing. When you're retreating, eh, not so much. But that's what the Romans were doing. Look at the terrain here, though. Isn't this gorgeous?
Look at the valley in there with the river. So we'll kind of follow on this here for the moment. We'll go uh, nav mode. Indicated airspeed, we want about 165. And altitude, yeah, baby. Yeah. we'll climb up. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much indeed. 14 months, dude. Cheers, man. Very kind of you. Okay, so what altitude are we looking for? 38? No, 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 no. A little bit higher, Murph. I'm going to get up there to about 5 if we can and engage. Okay, let's see what the chopper can do. Uh, we will be venturing off to the left here now in a moment, so we should be good. Look at that for the view. That's mad looking, isn't it? That's bananas. Jess, I hope we turn. You're not going to turn, are you? No, you're not going to turn. I mean, why would you turn? Not that way a bit. <laughs> easy, easy. Yep, the yard. Why have I lost torque? There we go. Okay, now we're laughing. Okay, we want that, that, and now that. Grant, continue on, helicopter, continue on. Uh, we were scaring the sheep again. Yes, yes, we were. Look at the state of that. That's incredible. So, the battle. That's where we're flying to tonight. The battle took place at the hilltop settlement of... Uh, Why did I write that in? Um, near the settlement of um, the Bracte. Caesar's legions formed a strong defensive line at the top of the hill, maximizing their defensive advantage. Now, I have a ton of links here I need to show you. Pictures paint a thousand words, you see, right? Bear with me. Okay. So, I want to show you the, um, the Gladius, just to put things into perspective. Okay, we should be good here for the minute. So the Roman sword, the Gladius, this thing was every bit as famous as your AK-47. This was responsible for more deaths until something like the AK-47 came along. This was the Roman Gladius, a short sword. It was the primary arm, if you like, uh, or armament of the Roman legions. You ever saw one of those before? Right? So that's the Gladius. Keep going forwards, Murph. When it came to the Legionnaires' equipment, or the Legions, what do they actually wear, right? Shh. Well, we have some stuff here, look. Look at the regalia here. Look at the setup here. The gear, right? The helmet. The javelin. The Gladius is there. The armor. Roman, not really sandals. They were sandals, but they had hobnails in them. They're like they're the earliest version of a hobnail boot, right? They had a water canteen. Uh, they carried all their own equipment. They had heavy armor. All the different tools that they had. You remember that the Romans, they were engineers as well, apart from like your standard legion, who had equipment to build fortifications and indeed roads. So that was the kind of general layout of what a legion would wear. Pretty cool, right? We're still flying. We haven't died. This is brilliant. This is just fantastic, right? Looks like fancy crocs, I'm telling you. Uh, this is the... The pilum, or the pilum. This is the javelin. See it there? Imagine that thing coming at you. And Roman uh, legions, they were able to fire these things from quite the distance away. A huge distance away. Imagine that coming at you at a rate of knots. With the jays, then. Now, 
Here we shall do some reading. So the Helvetii, the, Confedera the Confederation of Gallic Tribes, did their migration. Caesar, who is governor of Transal Transalpine and Cisalpine Gaul, got word of this, so we know the whole thing left. So, the battle. The legions uh, were pursued by the Helvetii across the plains until they caught up. So the battle, when it started, lasted many hours into the night until the Romans finally took the, um, the Helvetii baggage train. So remember when we were saying that the decreased speed to maintain altitude. Decreased speed to maintain altitude. Ah, gotcha. We bring our speed down like this. There we go. Thank you, Epic Fool. Thank you, Epic Fool. Remember we were saying that the Helvetii, when they wanted to migrate, they burnt down all their villages and towns. There was no coming back. They got rid of the whole chagging thing. Um, so you can imagine, if you pack up your entire civilization and you bring it with you in your baggage train, well, what happens if you lose or someone takes your baggage train? Curtains. Game over, ball burst. According to Caesar, 130,000 enemies escaped, of which 110,000 survived the retreat. Eek. So after the battle had ended, it took Caesar three days for his troops to recoup. It was massive, absolutely massive. They were shagged. After all the fighting, they were exhausted. They had to resupply, they weren't well, you know, all this stuff came into it. So after the three days, Caesar then uh, went out to look for the survivors and he gave a warning that if any town or any other tribe gave aid to these people, uh, they would be met with fierce consequences. Eventually, Caesar caught up with the survivors and they were like, hey man, no, we've had enough. So Caesar sent them back and he said, okay, head back to your, uh, head back to your lands, back up to where you came from. And um, they acted then as a buffer between Rome and the Germanic tribes forevermore. But they were completely decimated. Like they were, they were just pretty much annihilated. A starting force of 350, some 15 or 16,000. That's all that were left. So, like, game over, ball burst, right? Heavy going, to say the least. Now. Up a ball. Where are we at now? That was... Oh, right, okay. Some of the equipment we'll talk about, right? So, some of the Roman equipment, as we saw with the Gladius, we saw with the... Uh, with that javelin, the ro the armour, all of that jazz, right? The Romans also built siege engines. These were massive, massive bits of equipment. The, uh, the ballistae, or the ballistae, it was a powerful siege engine capable of launching heavy bolts or stones at high velocity. They were used for attacking fortifications and enemy infantry from a distance. Think of your early artillery, right? Onagers. Onagers were similar to catapults and were used to hurl heavy projectiles such as stones or barrels filled with burning material at any uh, enemy positions. They were effective in sieges and against massed infantry. Ouch. Of course, battering rams if they needed to get down by the gates. They also built siege towers. They were mobile wooden structures used to breach the walls of fortified cities. They allowed the Roman soldiers to approach the enemy defences while being shielded from any enemy missiles. So, Roman siege stuff. Wait to see some of this, right? So, from this picture here, you can see some of it, right? So your Onagar... That's Testudo, but that was, apart from being, you know, a bit of hardware, they, they used that uh, with their shields. The Ballista, it's like a giant slingshot. Catapults were used as well, and then you had these siege towers. Absolutely nuts looking. Like the engineering genius back then. Do you know what I mean? 
a Roman arrow machine. Like, the Romans versus anything in Gaul, on a military scale, they were in completely different leagues. Completely different leagues. When you're looking at guys who were just able to fight, you know, with conventional arms, and then you had the Romans with this sort of stuff, siege weaponry, game changer. There's an Asta Ballista. Look at this thing. A big heavy rock. It's a giant slingshot. Vroom, off it goes. Imagine catching one of them in the head. It's mad, lads, isn't it? A lot of these designs, they were taken from, well, history, naturally enough. Um, was it Archimedes? I'm almost certain it was. He built a whole load of these um, during the defense of his city. He had all sorts of stuff in there. Anyone who's done, anyone involved in artillery, you know what this stuff is. I mean, granted, it, it's different now because it's all hydraulics, but like back then, slingshots. It's almost like putting, you know, the shovel on the ground and kicking the shovel to launch something. Now that's that's the idea. But it meant that they could hurdle like incredibly heavy and big, um, you know, rocks or. Um, anything anything that boulders I mean they'll just absolutely launch it that's the remains of the siege ramp at Masada that was a huge setup that was an entire ramp that they built pretty mad right pretty mad engineering and fortifications the Roman camp design Caesar's legions were known for their efficient camp construction skills they would create temporary fortified camps whenever they uh, halted during the campaigns and these camps were often rectangular and included ditches, ramparts and watchtowers for protection. A vallum was a type of fortification consisting of a ditch and an earthen rampart. Romans would often construct a vallum around their camps to fortify their position. Then they had trenches and defensive walls. When conducting sieges or preparing for battle, the Romans would dig trenches and build defences um, usually with walls or palisades, and these are used to protect their flanks and rear during any engagement. They'd effectively dig themselves in. Do you know? Bridge building. Romans were skilled at constructing temporary bridges to facilitate river crossings for their armies, enabling them to maintain mobility and control. So, over this neck of the woods, there's nothing major here. The Seon River, it's, it's quite big. Later on, when Caesar gets to the Rhine, and, like, that was deep. That was, like, Jesus, that would have been 30 metres or 10 metres in some places. Uh, and the Romans were well able to build a bridge to get around it. Look at all the choppers. This is class looking. And then, of course, we have the roads. The Romans were known for building well-engineered roads to facilitate troop movements and logistics. These roads were essential for maintaining their military presence throughout of Gaul. Anywhere the Romans went in force, they built roads. It was the quickest way to get their people moving. I mean, think about it, right? Looking down at the scenery now, I mean, you can see where there's roads and valleys and all this sort of jazz. But like some of these original roads or some of the some of the tracks of these roads, they would have been built on original Roman roadways. How mad and weird is that? Like deforestation, back then there would have been a lot more trees, right? And rather than marching all the way through the trees, um, well, through forests and whatever else, in a lot of the clearing areas across farms or whatever, they built roads. And a lot of them are still there. Like, when you think about what it would have been like back then, right? Like, okay, the areas in which that we're all moving from, the... Why am I wearing glasses? Wait, glasses! Like... The ground in which you have to cover, and you're doing it on foot, or, you know, if you're lucky, you have a horse. You're building roads as you go. You're making deals with allies if you can. Uh, or you're, you know, you're you're just going in, ransacking the place to get supplies to resupply. Um, moving across this sort of country, which at the time, no other Roman really pushed forward into Gaul. I mean, there was never an expansion into Gaul prior to this. 
there's been a couple of engagements and certainly the Romans held a fear for the Gauls. The Gauls, well, they were the bogeyman. They ransacked the place. They actually sacked Rome uh, in the third century BC. So picking a fight with these big, hairy, mad looking devils, you know, they're much, much taller. The average Gaul was much taller and bigger than the Roman. I mean, Germans, some of the French lads, they're all big, big guys. Um, they were quite intimidating. So for Romans to be going up this neck of the woods, I mean, this was a something. The legions must have been terrified. And yet that kind of goes back into the, the strength and kind of the charisma of what Caesar had, um, especially over his troops. They absolutely loved him and they would literally, they followed him everywhere and they would follow him anywhere. It's mad. Then you have like, you know, language barriers, culture clashes, not knowing, you know, the weather, right? I mean, the Mediterranean, very different weather than kind of northern France and, you know, Britain. Freezing, do you know, in comparison. But they managed it. And then you have to think about the battles, the warfare. Not just the, you know, the hand-to-hand the -hand physical combat and the impact that would have, but also the psychological warfare. The Romans had a very distinctive colour. Red was their colour uh, when it came to their legions. That was adopted centuries later by the British Redcoats. Red in battle it looked, stood out. Then they got the, what were the, what do you call them? The big massive hat thing. They're not hats, but what are they called? You know the ones I'm talking about. The, the Bush, the somethings are, they used to wear them. Liverpool, yeah, yeah. But red, it stood out, but they wore it for, there was a reason behind it. It wasn't like, oh, that's a terribly nice colour, it matches your eyes. It stood out. It was all psychological warfare stuff. Um, very true. What's the name of the big ones? No, the ones that the... Um, uh, you often see the... What are they called? Uh, bearskin. You know the big massive bearskin? That just... Uh, with this, Eddie, hey, thank you very much indeed. Welcome aboard. Yeah, bearskin. Yeah, yeah, not the bearskin. You know the big, massive, tall bearskin. But the reason for them is to make them look way taller than they actually were. Scared the crap out of the enemy. Oh Jesus! These lads are about twenty feet tall, or they just have a giant head. You know, I can sympathise with a giant head. Oh no, we're flying into another helicopter. It's terrifying. Jesus. Literally went through every bit of you. That was quite terrifying. It's okay now, though. But, like, that was the psychological warfare. Uh, or, sorry, that was the physical warfare, and then the psychological warfare. And, like, on top of that, Romans played music going in. You know, they had the... Whatever instrument, I forget, but, like, almost like a bugle. Then they had drums. Now, the Gauls, to an extent, or Ga Gallic tribes had the same... I mean, they'd scream running into battle, right? The, the, the other lads further north, they'd run in the nip. They'd be in the nip running at you. Ah, big hardy fella. Not wearing a nothing painted blue. Do you know? Mad. Uh, where are we at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big sound. The horn's making scary sounds. Right? Just... Nuts, lads. The psychological warfare. Like, when the, when the Romans were kind of rambling up towards, uh, up by the Rhine, I mean, there was ghost stories. You know what I mean? The enemy are 14 feet tall. They're big hairy fellas and they eat your face. Ah, oh, Jesus. Do you know what I mean? There was no way to... Relax, will you? What are you talking about? That doesn't exist. It's mad. But that's what would have went on. But then you look at the battles. Warfare over over centuries, warfare has changed so much. I mean, go back to somewhat recent-ish times. I mean, you look at the strategies and tactics used in the First World War, followed by the Second World War. The First World War, trench warfare. Bring your line, attack, you'll either win or you have to withdraw. The Second World War, completely different. New tactics, all speed, power, aircraft, air superiority. This entire thing that we love um, came true in this, well, it, 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 it advanced itself so much uh, because of um, conflict. Because of conflict. 
In the days of the Romans, things were very, very different. Very different. The Romans could, ca could cover a staggering 90 miles a day. What? They could, they can cover about 90 miles in a day, which is absolutely insane when you think about it. No chariots, no fast movement, 90 miles a day. Crazy. That's like, that's moving at, a standard soldier's march is about five miles an hour, right? So like in 20 hours, you know what I mean? So like 19 hours a day, it's incredible when you think about it. Uh, quick march, yeah. Like, talk about a quick march. You'd be absolutely shagged after that, wouldn't you? You'd be shagged. Old veteran, good to see you. Be Carla, welcome in. Are we stopping here? Uh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're doing a stop just here. Uh, the, the Danish uh, Livgarde, the king wore bearskin helmets. Yeah. They still wear it today, 100%. Hello there. Uh, think that they were in better shape than us in them days. Yep. What load were they carrying? Everything that they needed themselves. Weapons, uh, gladius, javelin, food, rations. You know, they may not have had exactly like a full, you know, resupply of everything but everything that they needed they carried because they still had you know elements of baggage trains but they weren't needed until days after that the romans carried enough on them to survive in the field for days i think the most of the supplies came behind them in baggage trains the heavy stuff ancient crocs indeed and it's it's like when you think about it and like think of the battles as well now, okay, they had they had seasons when it came to you know campaigns and fighting. They didn't fight in the depths of winter. They usually didn't fight at night time. But it's just incredible when you think about it. Think of the physicality needed to do that. If don't if any of you guys have actually lifted a, a, a gladius or even a sword, they're heavy. Imagine wielding that thing all day. Eesh. They carried about 50 odd pounds of stuff. Yeah, sometimes even more. Oh! Sometimes even more. Hey, Admiral Ted is here. Good to see you. Um, you can already hear the sounds of the bagpipes, right? Ruben, that's a great point. You look at the Scots with the bagpipes. Not only the Scots, other militaries took it on as well. Do I use the Airbus Thrustmaster? Uh, no, this is the verbal stuff. Was that the 58 to 59 BC? It was, views. Yeah, that was the season. <laughs> it's nuts, though, isn't it? And then the Romans had this ability to combine their military forces like no one before. Do you know what I mean? Like, between the engineers, building the fortification, roads you know, palisades. Then, of course, Caesar, being Caesar, he recruited and raised legions all over the place, including mercenaries. He brought with him, you know, Numidian cavalry. He brought in Gallic cavalry. Pay enough gold to get your own army. I mean, that's what they used to do. Plus the provinces in which he operated from. Plus he would have got a lot of uh, legion power from Pompey. Some of Pompey's legions, his units, um, went to Caesar. Caesar asked for them. Remember the triumvirate. Pompey, Crassus and Caesar, they were all helping each other out. So if Caesar needed an extra legion or two, Pompey gave it to him. Now Pompey, that's what he was called, Gnaeus Pompey, Magnus Pompey the Great, he was a great general. No two ways about it. He was a, a one of the best generals Rome ever saw. So was Caesar. And the, you know, the affection that the troops had for Caesar... It was unbelievable. Like the lads would literally, they'd follow him anywhere. Follow him anywhere. This is a grand little airport, this. 
Me and my Foxtrot Golf Juliet. We're going to ramble in here. The nose down here a little bit. I see a Dougal. Easy. Okay, we'll try and put it down there. Pure hope you could see it. Such a good chop for this. There's good old Colonel Fork flying with us. Easy. Easy. Okay, that'll do us. Easy now, Jemima. Uh, Jill McQueen says, In Roman museums, they have legion made uh, of Playmobil with all the support units. Mules, carts, and so on. Really? Uh, see what's due to land a dumb tomorrow. I didn't see it, Admiral Ted. Real combat swords are light because they're used all day. I own several, says Kozaki. Maybe today they are. How expensive is it to fix the underside of a H160 after a gear up landing? Oh dear. Oh dear. My landing gear was down. Oh ye of little faith. I may have made a complete and utter balls of everything else tonight, but I didn't forget the landing gear. Yet. Yet. There's still time. <laughs> There's loads of time for me to forget the landing gear. Right, lads, we're doing well here. So, quick check on a navigraph. So, we have a little POI we're going to fly to next. This is where the Seine River is. And it's roughly here. Seine, Seine. Roughly here is where the crossing uh, that Caesar attacked the other guys. Because he had a vantage point looking down. Right, so we're going to head to there next. It's only a little bit up the road. Then, we head down to where um, Riccate is. Down here. Big Brac... Big Bracte. Big Bracte. I keep saying it wrong. Um, I meant to send it on to, uh, to Nightsef. Your man saying... Uh, your man saying Big Bracate. Brilliant, right? So what are you saying? Oh, deadly. Okay, but that'll tell you. I didn't even yeah, see that. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Eagle Airways, thank you very much indeed for the... Oh, uh, for the... Tier 1 for 12 months, man. Uh, crazy. Thank you very much indeed. So what we're going to do, after we get to the river, we're going to fly over this way. And this is the actual area where the battle was fought. We'll get to see all the terrain and stuff. Right? So we're nearly there, lads. You'd be only delighted to know. <laughs> it was a successful landing, don't worry. Come on, Patrick. Keen Lafford is here. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Let's see you, Keen. Uh, another gaming. Thank you very much indeed. Five months, man. Cheers. These are all very kind, considering, you know, the state of the content tonight. But I thank you very much. Now, check for fuel while we're here, lads. We've barely used any. This is fantastic. Fantastic. Right. Let us get ready to venture again. It's made of 15 little Playmobil Romans. 15,000? What? There's content. Since when? Now, why aren't my trims resetting? That's worrying. Okay. Oopsie daisy. Easy. Easy. Okay, so it's going to be over to the left. Yes. We're looking good. Okay. More collective. Put the nose down. Gear in. That's okay, Julia. Our landing gear is now in. 
Keep it around 15 degrees, up to 10 degrees. Watch the torque. Level up and fly. Nice. Okay, trims are behaving themselves now. Me and Keen have a story for you. Something quite awkward and hilarious happened outside our school. Tell us! Tell us! This is funny. I passed through this area at least once a year, usually to get petrol. Never realised that Caesar fought a battle here. It's nuts! It's absolutely nuts. And like, okay, if we say a strong battle here, we're very, very close, but there definitely would have been skirmishes. Caesar was following the Helvetian troops, or the Helvetian... The, the entire migration were moving through here. And like, there would have been other Gallic tribes in this region saying, Hey, uh, where do you think you're going, man? You know what I mean? So let's have a look. Altitude, acquire. Ah, uh, we'll bring her down here a smidgen. Let's call it 3,000 feet. Lock her in. Nav mode. Indicated speed. 120. And we should be happy with that. I'll tell you this in a second. I'm doing something. Okay. I'll let Keen tell it. I'm a, I'm a horrible storyteller. Now. The durations of battles, the evolutions of the battles, so the early battles, right? In the early days of warfare, battles often involved relatively small groups of warriors clashing in direct combat. These engagements were often brutal and short, with the outcome often determined by the physical prowess and weaponry of the warriors. Then you had formation warfare. Civilizations developed armies, became more organized, and battles evolved into formation-based warfare. Soldiers were grouped into formations, such as the phalanxes for Greece or legions for the Romans, and also shield walls. These formations provided better coordination and protection. Siege warfare followed, then it came to cavalry and missile weapons, and then siege engines themselves. But what about an individual battle? What about a battle of the day? How did it all start? Well, usually two forces would pick their, pick their areas on the battlefield, you often heard it said, you know, always choose uh, your battles. There was a reason for that. Because if for whatever reason you were, you know, at a location and the terrain just didn't suit what your forces were, or indeed it didn't suit you, well, you're starting off at a massive disadvantage. Caesar knew strategy. He understood tactics. And by giving himself every available chance... When it came to the terrain, well, it always played dividend. Choose your battles wisely. And that's what Caesar did. So the early stages of any battle, there could be small skirmishes. They're usually done as creating, like, diversions. Usually what happens if you, you know, launch out a small, say, I don't know, a company, 50 people or so, that's enough to cause a distraction to allow you to move cavalry units around. And the idea with cavalry is, well, you want them to attack the flanks or encircle the enemy position. So you create a decoy. That was the early part of it. Next up then, you have the heavy formation moving. And it could be from, you know, arrows, right? There could be uh, arrow volleys going in to attack at range. Or it could be an onslaught of just infantry, head on head. Auxiliary forces were used a lot. A lot of the time, Caesar would use his auxiliary forces first. That would kind of invite the enemy in, giving them a false sense of security, thinking that, well, these guys are, eh, they're kind of a pushover, it's fine. Um, but then, you know, the, the seasoned veterans of the legions, well, they'd come in and tidy up after that. Plus, Caesar used to ride with his own uh, cavalry. He rode into battle himself, which was nuts. I mean, think of that. You're on the battlefield and here's your leader. Here's Caesar. And he going in with you. Come on, you devil. Do you know, the troops loved it. Always looking to bright side of life, right? So a duration of a battle, when you think about it, from the initial skirmishes to the full-on battlements, then whatever tactic you deployed, be it with, you know, cavalry coming in off the flanks, it could last all day. And I mean, like, from sunrise up until, like, nightfall. 
all day on your feet fighting you could only be gaining five or six feet in an hour across a battlefield that's how slow and like you know physically draining these things were yeah this is cool this here lads this is the river the very river when the Helvetii were crossing Caesar waited until about three quarters of them got to the far side Caesar then moved in and destroyed the remaining 25% and as I said that drove them nuts they just couldn't get over it how could you possibly where is your sense of honour Caesar didn't care what they thought he was there to destroy them by any means necessary kind of nuts Colonel Fork, that's very true. War, the more things change, the more it stays the same. War never changes. As the managers say, we aren't here to make friends, indeed. Like the way Murphy loses the battle of uh, on small things, so he wins the war on the bloody new kitchen. <laughs> right, we're going to hover down here over this river. Just to get kind of a general sense of the location that we're at. And again, it's... You know what I mean? Go back some 2,000 years ago. As an aside, the service stations in the area are great for stocking up on mustard. Huge selection of Dijon mustard. Nice. We're very close to Dijon. Okay, we want to watch for the old uh, sunglasses and also a vortice here as well. Isn't it just mad though? Now, could you imagine hundreds of thousands of people? And then Caesar just waiting, lying in wait. Vortex, vortex. Watch the vortex. Vortex, vortex, vortex. Easy. Easy. Check power. Got an awful lot of those vortexes in this chopper. Okay, an unscheduled stop, but it's scheduled. That's the joys of having a helicopter, right? We can touch down and really check it out. So get over to the river here a little bit. Easy. Right. Put it down there, Murph. I'll do it. Okay, let's have a quick look of where we are, right? So, think about this region crossing over. Okay, the river doesn't look that too fantastic here in the sim but like these be deep right so moving all your people across it's going to take ages is there rafts are you putting ropes across right think of women and children they're not going to get across terribly fast caesar knew all of this so when roughly three quarters of them went across he unleashed what are they going to do they're not going to run back they just look on and go balls <laughs> they've been completely lifted out of it you know what i mean it's nuts. As long as it's not Pat Mustard. <laughs> Pat Mustard. Brilliant. Caesar invaded Gaul for the mustard. Yes, yes, yes. 
We crossed that river in 1944. Hmm? Sabre says, does the H160 have windshield anti-ice? Uh, yes, it does. VRS is modeled. That isn't normal in others. Uh, I think VRS is in the Cowan Sim stuff, Sean. I think. Bailey Bridges. There you go. Can I put my massive tool in your box? <laughs> ah, brilliant. Hey, Patal is there. Nice. 125. We got some really nice choppers with us tonight, lads. It's always nice jumping back into the choppers, isn't it? Did anyone take an alouette? Surely someone's taken an alouette. Look at all the choppers we have, though. Isn't it fantastic? Beautiful. Right. We ramble it on. I just, do you know what? Genuinely, isn't it absolutely incredible that we can visit these places in the sim? When you think about it. There's a power there now, Tony. Oopsie daisy. Gear up. Alright. Who needs <laughs> who needs to go to Vegas? Yeah, you can do it in the sim. And in a mass group, yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? Like when you think about it, like we can explore these places. Oh Jesus Murph, don't break it. We can explore these places in the sim. I absolutely love that. It's incredible. Okay, we'll keep our altitude at a thousand feet. We don't need to be too high here. Once it holds our altitude, we should be good. Easy. So you have all your fighting. You have all your battles. You know how long it takes. You know about the equipment. What about the people? Who's in charge? Who's in charge, right? So the commanders, military leaders issued orders uh, and they commanded their troops. So how did that work for the Romans? Well, you had generals. You had a number of generals. Caesar, General Caesar, but you, he had generals within his ranks as well. I mean, don't forget, a legion was made up somewhere between four and six thousand, usually five and a half thousand. And in that then you had centurions. You had, you had all different ranks that we'll have a look at here now in a second, right? You also had various signals. So when the commander, you know, wanted his intent, I want you to do this, you had various signals. They could have been whistle blasts, flags, trumpets, drums. They were all tools used for signaling your intent. You also had flanking and maneuvering. So if you were part of a flanking maneuver, you had to receive your orders before you went and then be on the lookout to get your signal of when you can move in, especially if you're going in to attack, be it cavalry or otherwise. Now, where are we going here? I think our altitude is okay. Now, do, 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 do. The, uh... Communication in ancient times was slow. If the Helvetii sent a message to Caesar and awaited a response, the delay would be like waiting for a letter mailed by snail mail today. We are now. So, Roman rank structure. One second now. I have notes all over the place. So in command of each legion usually was a legatus. The legion was composed of 10 cohorts, each commanded by a tribuni, military tribune, and then each cohort was comprised of six units of 100 men each, of, a, of which each were controlled by a centurion. A centurion was over about 100 men, right? So you had a legatus, 
So you had a general, a legatus, then you had your ten cohorts, each cohort commanded by a military tribune, each cohort uh, was composed of six units of a hundred men each, and they were in control of, uh, or they were controlled by a centurion. That was the major rank structures. Quite a lot. Centurions, they were like, the your captain or your kind of sergeant in today's terms, kind of, you know? Like, you look, you break it down. So a legion, that's probably, what, battalion strength? Um, maybe less. Then brigade. Then you'd have a division. Then you'd have, like, an army. <laughs> right? And each of the legions had its own number. You know, Legio XI, for example. Caesar's favourite legion, and probably the most famous, they were known as the Tent Legion. And later on, it was during the Gallic campaigns, they became known as the Tenth Mounted Legion. Uh, because they got on horseback uh, for a story we're going to learn a little bit later on. Right? The Tent Legion. Yeah, yeah. Patrick says, Murph, it's story time. Right, tell us, tell us the story. This is important. Okay, we're moving at speed. See this high ground ahead of us, lads? Yeah? This is Bibracte, just ahead of us. Kane will have it written out in a moment. Now, after the Helvetii were um, defeated, what next? I mean, was that it? Well done, Caesar. You've, you've, you've taken over. Well done. No. Two things happened. One, well, the Gallic tribes, the allies, if you like, of Rome. Thanks very much. You're brilliant. Uh, we'll be seeing you off. Caesar, he wasn't going anywhere. And his legions weren't going anywhere either. Then, without warning, some Gallic tribe asked his German cousins for a little bit of help to get rid of another Gallic tribe. And by doing so, uh, they invited a fellow called Ariovistus across the Rhine and into Gaul. This now posed as a massive problem for Caesar because you have German tribes under Ariovistus now making their way into Gaul. What happened, once, the, you know, some of the other Gallic tribes who said, uh-oh, there's a whole load of Germans coming in, they needed Caesar's help. In fact, most of Gaul were happy that Caesar was in Gaul because, well, you know, they didn't want to be dealing with German tribes. Ariovistus, he was just waiting on an invitation. He was in the same kind of scenario as Caesar. He was looking for, he wanted to take over the world, man. So next week we're going to focus on Ariovistus and the Suebi. That's learning about, you know, the German side of this, which is very, very interesting. But effectively, Ariovistus came across the Rhine with a whole load of troops and a lot of the Gallic tribes were like, oh, bother, we can't be dealing with this. Caesar, would you come up here and give us a hand? And that's pretty much exactly what happened. Pretty much. So this high terrain, we're on our way, right? It's, it's a little bit further on. We've about, yeah, from here, 25 miles or so. We have a good train of people with us today. It's been huge. Right, before Keen gets here with a story, because he is writing a story, can I climb a bit more? That's 2,000 feet. Get us up there, Murphy, another little bit. Let's go tree for the crack. Engage that. So what we'll do, we'll do another count. Uh, so if you're still here with us, Xbox Pilots press 1. If you're on the PC, press 2. There isn't anything offensive in it. That's okay, Keen. If you're here looking forward to Keen's story, I know I am, uh, will you press number 3?
Aiden J. Robbins, thank you very much indeed for the super chat. Sounds of this are amazing, aren't they? Uh, 31 on PC, 1 on VR, 1 on console, 126 passengers plus a Murph, and only 112 days to the Eurovision. Stories on Discord. Ah, uh, Jay's is key. Hang on a second now. The Bremen Bar, no doubt. Hang on a second. So basically, myself and Paddy walked, it, walked to a service station during lunch in school. While we were walking back, this woman started shouting at us from across the road, You shouldn't be eating that junk food, lads! Sandwiches is what you should be eating! The local cool lads started to approach her, completely oblivious to the fact that she's an oddball. Put your rubbish into the bins, you lads, in your Tommy Hilfiger jackets! She shouted at the oncoming cool lads. Paddy and myself swiftly walked on. <laughs> only in Ireland. Only in Tipperary did I cut that butt. <laughs> I mean, do you know? But who are the local cool lads? Can't believe Keen referred to me as Paddy in the story. <laughs> Sorry, right, Patrick. All the notifications. You have no idea. You have no idea. And that's only since, like, what time? About 11 o'clock? About 11 o'clock. Many, many notifications. Many. I've been super busy the last two days. You'll see why. You know, in, I, I've been super busy. Have you heard of mute? No, I don't want to mute. I, I, listen. You say it all the time, but it is true. I read everything. Except for that comment Gibbo put up. That, I haven't seen that yet. Because there's a big 747 due into Dublin Airport tomorrow. I didn't read it yet, but I do read it. <laughs> Patrick, forever known as Paddy. Ah, Paddy. Ah, you poor eligible. It was one of those stories that you'd want to be there. <laughs> Brilliant. It's been a, it's it's just it's been a mad few days. Tonight though, like it's Jesus. Did you ever see it like it? In a hoop, in an absolute hoop. But anyway, as the week progresses, I'll fix everything. Don't worry. Wednesday on the uh, on the news, we get to check out something new. It's the new DA forty two by uh, Cows, known as Creator of Worlds. It's a brand new aircraft uh, in development for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And then on Friday night, we're going to be doing a VIP charter flight. For a scenic tour in New Zealand with FS Reborn's FSR 500. That should be fun. We also have a copy of the FSR 500 to give away. Also, GAS released their Stearman. Oh, did they? Golden Age Simulations. Thank you, Super Ty. I better grab a hold of that as well. There will be two aircraft we're checking out on Wednesday. Exciting news, man. Now, where's my notes? Right, now. 
if anyone like i don't want to just read out notes after notes after notes like this is the start of the campaigns like we've we've touched on you know the history a bit of rome we're focusing on caesar we've learned a bit about pompey and crassus the first triumvirate we're now learning about the initial campaign this is what started the entirety the gallic wars lasted almost 10 years this was the start of it this was the beginning of it this is what paved the way to everything else and everything else that we cover it's absolutely huge this is relatively basic this is understanding what the roman fighting force was all about what the the lay of the land was next week for example we look at the suebi ariovistus jura mountain skirmishes then we look at the belgae confronting the nervii tribes then we have the veneti that was an amphibious battle at sea essentially the romans fought at sea then we cross the rhine venturing into germania itself then the invasion of britain i mean what he rambles up into britain then no sooner have we gotten to britain we have to leg it back because there's an uprising and then finally we have the showdown at alicia with the tribal leader who linked all the Gallic tribes together, and he was known as Vercingetorix. Then we ramble back to Rome itself. Elea Iacta Est. The die has been cast. Caesar will cross the Rubicon with his army back into Rome. And that starts off a massive civil war. Caesar versus Pompey. That whole thing goes up until eventually uh, Caesar gets to Alexandria. Where he meets Cleopatra and we've all heard the story of Cleopatra but that's the the timeline of all of this it all links in together it's fascinating like what a what a fascinating uh, time do you know what I mean what a fascinating period of history the Gallic Wars for the next 10 years or so leading way to the civil wars Caesar facing Pompey they go down to you know Magna Graecia uh, down into Asia Minor and then they swing back into Egypt and then when they get to Egypt, the powers that were set up during the Alexander uh, kind of dynasty, if you wish, that was Ptolemy, Ptolemy II. And he, you know, he ascended the throne very, very young. His elder sister, they pushed her off to one side. They couldn't be dealing with that. That was Cleopatra. And Caesar put her back into power. You may have heard the romance, you know, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. At the time, during the Gallic Wars, Caesar had won Marcus Antonius. Mark Anthony. He became Caesar's best general and one of his closest friends. He's now active in these battles. Fascinating stuff, lads. Two dogs, good to see you. Uh, is there another F-35 in the sim apart from the IFE one? I don't believe so, no. Autumn coming up, the Roman capital after Caesar. I'm telling you, Augustus. Golden Age simulations, yeah. Mr. Dan, it is. Scythe, welcome in. Uh, Paddy, uh, Paddy, us a name that means nothing to me. Or Paddy is a name that means nothing to you. It's alright, Patrick. Don't mind them at all. I still think you're great. Okay, so the airport where we're going to be stopping is just over there, I think. Or there. We're very close to the airport that we're going to stop. But we want to head into these hills here. This area here... This is where it all happened. The Bracte. This is the location here. And when you think about it... This is where the whole Gallic campaign really started because there was a chain reaction. After the Helvetii were, were dealt with, Ariovistus comes across the Rhine, and then it's just carnage from here on in. It was said that Caesar killed over a million people. That's a genocide. And he enslaved a million more. Nuts. The loot is ahead of us. 
Yeah, baby. <laughs> Two dogs. Thank you very much indeed. 13 months, man. Minus 20? Jesus. Nights Up says, uh, thank you very much indeed, Two Dogs. Nights Up says, I have fond memories of racing downhill to the Roman city gates at autumn uh, after midnight of an old bicycle under the influence. Nice. There's museums up this neck of the woods and some of the artifacts that archaeologists uh, rather have found. There were some just incredible things, right? So, yes, they had, like, the normal um, swords and armor and, you know what I mean, spearheads. But they also found some really nasty weapons as well. The early day version of a landmine. Which is essentially a bit of metal that had, you know, it went across and then up like, a, like an arrow that was completely bent. It was hidden in the ground. But the way the spike was on the top of it, it was like a triangle. So when you stood on it, you were not getting back off of it. Like the Romans had some horrible, horrible weaponry. Caesar and finally Rome fall. Too much conquest. Yeah. Like the, but like it shaped much of, uh, a lot of um, Western culture. It shaped a lot, an awful lot of it. Like, Roman art and architecture, they still inspire us to this day. And, you know, the their values, uh, their traditions, there's still a lot of them in, in our world today. Like, it's, it's mad when you think about it. Okay, this is the neck of the woods. You can see where we have high terrain here. So, the Romans where I won't say retreating, but they were trying to get back here as quickly as possible to get resupplied. They were rushing back here. And the Helvetians were chasing them. Chasing them down. Maybe like, I'm the Romans and everyone else at the Helveti. Ah, Jesus! Am I going to make it? And like, the terrain here, it is unforgiving. It's quite high. There's hills all over the shop. You know, having a bird's eye view gives us such a great advantage. Back then, they hadn't a clue, lads. They hadn't a clue. So this area just up here, there's a car park. There's a visitor center. We're going to see, can we put it down just up here? Because this in the real world, there's, a, there's an on-site museum here. Didn't the Romans have a spear that would break off inside? They did. They had a spear that when it hit you, it expanded. Like the spokes of a bicycle. Absolutely terrifying stuff. Okay, we want to go into this location here. So we should... This area here, that's actually a car park, right? Get the gear down. Easy does it. Watch your speed. I mean, look how high we are here. Look at the vantage point you have. Watch your vortex, Murph. Vortex. 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 Easy. Vortex. Vortex. Check power. Okay, easy does it now. So this building just beneath us, that's the visitor center. And they have a ton of artifacts in here. Like, these are... Caesar wrote part of the uh, commentaries of the Gallic War. Yeah, he did. The museum is excellent. I haven't been nights out, but I'd love to go. But the, the museum, like, this is the area. I mean, this is where it all happened, you know, over 2,000 years ago. Freaking nuts, isn't it? Easy. Very hard to fly this from the external view. I see you can put it down somewhat gently.
On a bit Dreamy, of a sleepy, ah, nighty, snoozy, Jesus, snooze. that was terrifying. Easy. Easy. We're on a hill, so we just want to allow for that. Easy now. Go on, get it down, get it down. Okay, brakes on. And sit tight for a moment. We're kind of half sliding, but we should be... That doesn't look great at all. But anyway, <laughs> we're down. So, let's have a look at this region, right? So here's where the museum is. There's a car park. And then we follow on all the tracks up here. And it's up here. Well, these, these are where the battles took place. I mean, think about it. I mean, look at the height they're at here. How calm it is now. But back then, I mean, you're talking a force of well over 100,000. Well over 100,000. And granted, there's an awful lot of trees and stuff like that here. Which there shouldn't be that many. But you get the idea, don't you? So this entire region, this is where the battle took place. Isn't it mad when you think about it? What's that? Hmm. Most unusual. Weird. Um, isn't it mad, lads? Supply logistics must have been brilliant for the time. When you think about it. Tail camera full of mud. Totally fine. Defence on top of the hill just seems kind of logical. The bag... Yeah, 100%. That was the whole point. Caesar would have had his scouts on the peaks here. Looking out. Waiting for the attack. And the Helvetii guy having to come up the hill to face the Romans. Sure, the Romans were straight away at an advantage. Pretty cool, right? The Bracte. So, like, the region. If you have a look at the region, right? This hilltop, I mean, this is... The, the Roman forces were here. This is the this is the point of getting them there. Skirmishes all along here. I think the main battle was somewhere... We have a note here in the map, look. So, if we look at the actual battle, right? Uh... Do-do-do-do. Uh, Bracte. So, let's have a look here now. Let's do this through the back. Where the fighting took place was in a region, I think it's something like 14 kilometres in any direction, roughly. But there's all, there's archaeological finds up in the hills, there's archaeological finds down by the river, right? But it's where the baggage train, I think that's where they signalled the end of, well, not necessarily the end of the hostilities, but certainly... That's where victory was. It's when the baggage train of the Helvetii was captured, which was around here. Some of the battles that would have been north, south, east um, of, of this entire region, all around. It's pretty much what the camera's looking at now. All that area, roughly, around this location here, where the museum is. Because, like, there's a ton of artifacts up there. They found a ton of stuff. Now, whether or not that was a place that the Romans stayed... But they didn't have an awful lot of time to wait. I mean, the Helvetii pretty much caught up with them straight away. But it's all this region here. And you're just kind of, where are we? We're southwest uh, of Dijon. Just to give you an idea, roughly in the world where we are. But the high ground, that's what Caesar was going for. High ground. That, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. And if, if, you know, the more you look around all the other regions, it's not really high ground here. Caesar went for the high ground. There's a bit down that way, but this, this appears to be probably some of the highest land in the area. It's mad, isn't it? Go back 2,000 years ago. What would the site have been here in this area? 
Just nuts, lads. Just nuts. Nuts. Right. Uh, where are we now? We're over here. Dish. Town of... Okay, town of the Bracte. The Burgundy region, by the way. Uh, that's the museum. This is what it looks like in real life. Dish. So you can see all the areas, yeah? Look at some of the stuff they found. Jesus. And what else do we have? The excavations of the museum. The town of Bibracta was abandoned 2,000 years ago. It's now slowly rising from the ashes. Yes. So there's a whole town there. Do you know what that is? That must be up where, um, where the other building is. Look at it there. Look at the views in it there, look. When the town of uh when the town was abandoned, it was replaced by Autumn or August uh Augusto Donum. Ooh. So we are where are we? We're here, I think. How do we zoom out the map? There's Autumn, that's where we're heading for. Yeah, that's where we are, we're over here. That's mad, Ted. Mad! Right, we should ramble now. Back to the airport. Are we ready? The Roman walls, yeah. Crazy. You can see on the ground textures. Yeah, we'll go over and have a quick gawk. It's over here, I think. It's behind us. Ramble backwards here for the moment, because I think it's where Cancep is there at the minute. That's, that must be it there, look. Excavating all the area. That's nuts, lads, isn't it? Hey, there's Echo Charlie. Good to see you. Okay, gear up. And let's ramble on. There's loads of Roman history in Chester. Ooh. There's the car park. So it was here, as we say, this was this was pretty much the end of the Helvetii. The Romans beat them. So it's after this event things started getting absolutely friggin' nuts. Chester? I hardly even know her. Jesus. Okay, let's have a look here now. So... Trims. Alt. Speed. And... Okie dokie. A lot of Roman history over in Chester. I have to check it out. Chester's not too far. Like, it's cast, like, when we were in Normandy, we've been to Normandy quite a few times, right? And I've never really focused on any of the, uh, on the Roman history there. I mean, it's always Second World War stuff. But it's only after reading up on the Gallic Wars, uh, with the Veneti. Holy crap, like, the amount of history up that neck of the woods. There's a French movie about Vercingetorix and Alicia, but it's not really good.
Let's see the auto land in this. Auto land. Let's have a look. Uh, automatic hover, no. Altitude acquire. How do we do the... I'll leave that as it is. An auto land. Epic fool. Can you talk us through it? Or do like do I need to put in coordinates and stuff? I do. Let's see what happens here. Or if I'm okay to drop a little snip of info into the chat. 100%? 100%. Uh, auto hover, then beep trim it down. Gotcha, okay. What did Romans do in Chester? The Romans built Chester as a strategic position uh, at the centre of the Roman Britain with plans to sail from the River Dee to invade Ireland and North Wales. Today, you can still walk along Roman roads in the centre of Chester, the Via Pretoria and the Via Principalis, now Bridge Street and Eastgate. No way! Yeah, I think the Roman interest in... Um, Roman interest in, in Ireland, or Hibernia as it was known at the time, we didn't really offer anything. It was just, it was another smaller island uh, full of mad barbarians, right? And, you know, we were Gauls to them as well. Now, they knew of us. I mean, there was, trade was done. Roman artifacts have been found in places of Ireland, mainly coins and stuff like that, you know? But w w there was no resources here that interested the Romans. Slaves, maybe, that's about it. It's still a small island full of mad barbarians. True, very true. Nothing changed. But you know what I mean? Like, Caesar looked at Britain because he thought there were, uh, he thought there was pearls there. Pearls. No, no pearls in England. So he didn't know that. Easy now. Want to bring our altitude down? Now, let's see how she handles this. The amphitheatre there, went to school many years ago. The archaeologists are sticking it up. Nice. Sterling says, I lived in a place in Belgium that was built in the 11th century. Super neat, but not quite Roman. Yeah. It's mad, like, you can see, like, in modern buildings, in ancient buildings, you can see Roman architecture friggin' everywhere. It's mad. Is that Sim doing that to anyone else with the ground textures appearing and reappearing? I wonder how they got the idea that there were pearls in Britain. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That was the rumour. Just look at everyone down there. Okay. Let's kick it out with this for the moment. Get ourselves nice and low, then we'll go auto-hover. And then, oh Jesus, and then we'll ease it down, right? The texture is, uh, thing is DX12 artifact. I don't have DX12. I'm using DX11 and it's still happening. So what does that tell us? Okay, easy now. Uh oh. Careful now. Okay, sweep down here to the left. Good girl, Julia, doing a great job. We're gonna call your man back there with his gloves, Hans. Well, Hans. Such a beautiful chopper this though, isn't it? Oh nice! So with an M117, epic fool, you mad devil you.
So she's trying to go into a hover mode here, right? We go for the gear. And her stutters. Remember that for the moment. Saber found the DI, sir. Come on yourself. Now, next week we're flying the 414, the Chancellor. Ooh. Haven't flown that in a while. There's Cater Comet. Okay. Auto hover engaged. Uh, let's see what happens. We're probably a little bit high for this to do its thing, but let's see what happens, right? This is pretty cool, so it's in auto hover, right? Let's bring the altitude down a little bit. So far, so good. Sixteen hundred feet. Kane is back. Bet you didn't even realize that was gone. Right, Kane. Okay. Cyclic. Can we go forward here a bit? We can. We can. Ground speed hold. Hang on a second. Turn to off for a second. Check power. Vortex. Easy. 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 Vortex. Vortex. Easy. Push us forward there, because otherwise we're auto landing in the middle of a field, right? Push the nose forward there. Fill up a bit of speed. There we go. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. Now we'll put it into hover. And let's see how she reacts. I'm liking that. Jesus. We're dead. We're dead. Oh god, it's absolutely shite. Let me try that again. This auto land isn't as straightforward. Easy, Betsy. Speed is coming back. Didn't climb too Give much. Give yourself to the dark side. Right, easy. Let's try all of this again. Right, hover mode. Jesus. Oh. November 321, good to see you, man. Must be below 40 uh, to hover. That solves that. Flights of Joel, great to see you. So come here. We're, we, we're below 40. No oh, sorry. Okay, right. So get the speed up is what you're saying. All right, let's see here. We'll get there. We'll get there. your power little bit of speed watch your torque get us up to about 20 knots just roughly there hover mode 
and bring the alt down. This is what we're aiming for now. Let's see what happens. Now we're golden. Nice. Joel, it's great to see you, man. This is weird, right? You're not touching anything. All the helicopters out there, that's nuts looking. I don't mind if you go in the field, this is just to see you kind of do it. Okay, 200 to go. And how softly it'll do it, you know what I mean? And 40 to go. This is the uh, the H160 by High Performance Group. Okay, keep going. Any trees or whatnot around us? Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. So what's happening? James, 747 James. Thank you very much indeed for the subscribe. Cheers, man. I'm trying to do a thing that doesn't involve dying. 70 feet to go. This is terribly exciting, isn't it? It's on auto, like. 50 feet to go. Get a load of this guy. Ah, this is brilliant. How do I still have alerts working? Stupid thing! Easy now. That's so cool looking, isn't it? Look how cool that is! Softest landing ever. 14 feet, 13 feet. It looks like we're hovering. right friends look at this car right here right typically you would fly into a hover and then enable auto hover rather than enabling auto hover while in forward flight gotcha okay we're learning i've never used auto hover before this is impressive cut the engines are you mad This is going to be the softest landing in the history. Look! Touchdown! Dreamy, sleepy, 16 feet! Snooze, snooze. 16 feet! Okay, it knows we're on the ground. Wow. That was ridiculous. 16 feet! I've been missing out! I've been missing out! Right. Let's hop on back over to the lads here for a second. Well, that was a lot of fun. Easy. 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 What's with all the dust? And why am I going off the runway? Oh, Jesus. Don't mind me, lads, it's totally fine. All is well in the realm. Leaner in that way. Leaner in that way. There's been a terrible accident. Ah, look at this. That's awesome. How cool does that look? Also, why is my chopper so friggin' giddy? Easy. 
The dust might be epic. That's okay. To look at this big E just... That's friggin' cool looking, isn't it? I can't seem to reset my trims. That's a huge problem. That's really, really weird. Right, turn off all that, right? Yeah, I don't see that control. Oh, here we go. Finally, my trims are working. I do have a trim reset, but look, it resets it like back into the sky. It's nuts. I'm just nose down here for a second. And then we add in a tiny bit of collective. There you go. There's your forward momentum. At an angle. <laughs> That's class looking, isn't it? Chopper just wanted to do a wheelie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, lads, that is so cool. You gotta love the choppers, man. Get to the chopper. Now, we need to fly. We're here with the Romans. What the Romans ever do for us? Irrigation, the aqueducts. Oh, Jesus, I nearly binned it. Careful now. What a beautiful friggin' chopper, though. Isn't this class looking, isn't it? Look at the state. It's only gorgeous. So, that concludes the crack element for tonight. What a night. What a night. I told you, I just, I'm going to roar myself to sleep. That's the night I've had. But listen, all messing aside, uh, we're hanging on in there. I do want to thank Gibbo for the lovely new frame. It's very nice, isn't it? I just need to fix it. Do you know what broke it? There was a 3D move effect for the last GG machine sign that went up. Still active. Because it was active. Dreamy, sleepy, nighty, snoozy, snooze. I'm going to bore you with, like, the, t the technical terms, right? It was still active in the scene not on the source and I only could have spotted that when being live uh, right I, you can't make that stuff up do you know what I mean what broke it Murph Murph broke it he had one job to do and I couldn't have known until I went live because it was all tickety-boo beforehand it's only when I went live the little move 3d transition gadget got me camera and went up down into the corner the curse of James's Street in it. But sure, listen, we, we survived. We survived. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us here this evening. The Gallic Wars Part 3 complete. Next week, we're taking the Chancellor, the 414, as we uh, learn about Ariovistus and the Suebi. The Germanic tribes are only rushing in over the Rhine, and we're going to go up and explore some new scenery. Um, tonight, it was more just to give us a bit of context of the setup, more so. Um... But yeah, I'm always open to uh, comments and opinions and suggestions and requests. So do be sure you keep up to date over on Discord as well. Let me know if there's anything else you want covered in this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. We're back on Wednesday. It's going to be busy. Two aircraft now to show. It's hard to call, lads. It's hard to call. There could be more. But uh, thank you so much indeed for tuning in. For all the likes on YouTube, I really do appreciate it, guys. All the super chats and the gifted sub uh, subscriptions on YouTube. You're very, very kind indeed. And to all of us here on Twitch, thank you so much indeed, lads. All the support, the follows, the, uh, the subs. Uh, I don't know what to say other than... Thank you very, very much indeed. Right, that's it now. I'm going to lie down. I'm going to scream myself going to sleep. And all should be well until, until Wednesday. We'll pick it up on Wednesday. Till then, take care. What's happening? Who's in charge? To see what's happening? A level eight. Hang on, I need to sit down. Level eight hype. Jesus, I'm at the rolling over me toe. Oh. Oh, it's Joe. It's all right. I'll walk it off. Oh, cramp. Jesus. Richie Ricardo. That's a big 10-4, good buddy. Soaring AJ. Muse van coming in over the 7-4. Oh, dear. Soaring AJ. <laughs> you were down and then you were back up again.